Funding for this program is provided by the National Institute of Justice. I'm James Wilson. Many kinds of people use the streets of our cities. People shopping, working, visiting, sightseeing. And people sleeping, begging, misbehaving. These are the homeless, the street people. By choice or circumstance, the number of homeless people on the streets of our cities has grown dramatically. Some are mentally ill persons who once might have been confined to hospitals. Some are persons or families who have lost their homes owing to poverty or family quarrels. Some are runaway youth, fleeing from unhappy homes and seeking the real or imagined opportunities and excitement of the big city. But many are single males, often alcoholics and usually loners, who live the life of hobos. They have been part of city life for as long as there have been cities. Though all of the homeless are a problem for society, the derelict male is a special problem. He sleeps and drinks in public places. He often begs money from pedestrians. He appears unkempt and disorderly. We ordinary citizens often, perhaps wrongly, feel threatened. We expect the police to do something. But what, in fact, can they do? Santa Barbara, California, an idyllic community along the Pacific coast, north of Los Angeles. White sands and palm trees, affluent citizens living the good life, tourists spending their money. And a growing community of homeless people living on the streets. They live uh, that type of lifestyle because that's the type of lifestyle that they desire to live. Sergeant Thomas Clemens is a member of a special police task force on street crimes. Uh, they like to live out on the streets uh, with little or no responsibilities and come and go as they please. Nancy McCready, a mother with two children who became homeless six years ago. Uh, most of the homeless people here in town that stick around are pretty, very morally, you know, uh, good people. Alice Hassler runs a shelter for the homeless. If they're not committing a crime and they want to be in the park all day, then I think that that should be okay. Paul Lamberton is a local businessman. Yes, there are more here this year than there were last year, as there were last year more than the previous year. Uh, at some point in time, if that continued, there could be a very real problem. Santa Barbara is not sure what to do about the problem. There is agreement that while 1,500 to 2,000 people are homeless here, only a small percentage are a police problem. There's a few transient people maybe coming through town who can cause a little bit of trouble, especially make it look bad for homeless people here in Santa Barbara. I also refer to them as street people because they're people who primarily don't get into shelters because they either don't want to or don't feel that they can. We've estimated that uh, the hardcore group of street people ranges anywhere from 50 to 70. And that will fluctuate from time to time. They'll, they'll congregate usually at uh, what is known as the Fig Tree, at Fig Tree Park in Santa Barbara. I pan out, I pan out a lot. And I make good money sometimes. For other people tell me, you know, get, get the hell out of here, get, get out of here, you know. Randy is an alcoholic who has lived on the Santa Barbara streets for at least four years. I, so I gotta fight some people, you know. Not on my own choosing, just because of what they call me. They call me a bum and say, I'm not looking for work, I'm not, look, I'm not trying to help myself. I tell them, go to hell, man, give me a job, you son of a bitch. So I tell them that, you know. Excuse my words, but that's what I tell them. And then I get in a fight, boom, you know, I got three people fighting me. Yep. You know, they like to jump on people homeless, you know. Randy is precisely the kind of street person Santa Barbara worries about, but doesn't know how to handle. 
While some citizens provide compassion, others call the police. It's been that way at least since 1912, when part of this estate was opened as a haven for hobos by a wealthy eccentric, Mrs. John Howard Childs. City authorities predicted a festering sore of crime and drug addiction. At its height, the hobo village had 40 shacks. So we have a heritage of taking care of people in that category that goes way, way back to 1912. There's been some write-up in the press in recent months that this is a very cold and inhumane community. That certainly is not the case. Businessman Paul Lamberton is talking about the bad press Santa Barbara got recently for a 1979 ordinance making it illegal to sleep in public. The city council rescinded the law in 1986 after homeless advocate Mitch Snyder threatened public demonstrations and Gary Trudeau ridiculed the city in his nationally syndicated cartoon, Doonesbury. Still on the books in Santa Barbara, a 1984 ordinance against public drinking and a street crime task force set up in 1983. Well, many of these people uh, living on the street um, with that type of lifestyle come in contact with uh, many of our business, business people and people shopping in the downtown, old town areas of Santa Barbara. Uh, just their mere presence sometimes intimidates people. Chris Ulmberg is manager of The Open Door, one of Lower State Street's many establishments that have been gentrified in recent years. You couldn't fill up your bar on Fridays or Saturdays nights. You didn't have a lunch crowd because the business people would not come down to Lower State Street. And it did get kind of, you know, uh, grungy down there. And But since I think that it's been getting better since that public drinking ordinance has been passed. In the last three or four years, uh, because of the Santa Barbara uh, Police Department, Sergeant Long has come in here a lot and uh, actively cleaned up the area. And they are they're uh, down here undercover, and they they do pick them up and keep them moving. And uh, now everybody everybody on Lower State Street, it's sort of the booming area. And I think there's less street fighting. I think there's less street crimes ed in that lower State Street area. And I think the merchants should count their blessings in that aspect. But there is a percentage of people who are still panhandling. It's all they have. Uh, so it, it uh, can become quite a problem uh, maintaining and control over these people because uh, it's so easy to commit these types of violations, the drinking ordinance, the moochings, uh, the sales, and so on of narcotics that. Uh, it's quite a task to keep up with. But I think that they probably have the sort of notion that if we arrest them and make it hard for them here, that they will move on. I don't think that's true. And from what I, the little that I've talked with them in on the street, that's not going to, if anything, that's going to make them angry and make them obstinate and make them want to stay. It's just not going to go away no matter what type of enforcement posture you have on it. You just can't sweep them up and move them out of town. Here to discuss these matters are Gerald Lowry, Chief of Police in Santa Barbara, Robert Hayes, Legal Counsel for the Coalition for the Homeless, and James Durkin, an inspector with the Philadelphia Police Department. Chief Lowry, explain to me now what laws in Santa Barbara govern public order. For example, is it illegal to be drunk in public? Yes, that's a state penal code violation. Um, the city also uh, passed in 1984 a anti-drinking ordinance which uh, allows an officer to contact a person prior to the time that he is intoxicated. If we see someone drinking on the street, we can approach him then before he becomes intoxicated and issue him a citation. Is it illegal to panhandle or beg for money? Yes, it is. That's a state penal code violation also. Is it illegal to sleep in a public place such as in a park or on a bus bench? Not at this point, no. But at one time it was? At one time it was part of an anti-sleeping, anti-camping ordinance. The provisions on sleeping have been removed. Uh, however, the camping ordinance still remains. How do you enforce these laws on public drunkenness, public drinking, panhandling, and the like? Do you wait for a complaint, or do the officers take their own initiative? Uh, quite often it comes by complaint, and other times it comes by initiative. Uh, arrest, and an officer may make an arrest if a person is intoxicated, and we then book at the county jail. If a person is merely drinking, we issue a citation. I see. Now, suppose we go back to that tape that you just saw and the bartender who said, the police down here on Lower State Street pick them up, keep them moving. What did he mean by that? Well, the, that is referring to the old town area of Santa Barbara Street, and it was, uh, it's a district 
uh, near the waterfront that had uh, badly gone uh, downhill. Uh, there were a lot of transits in the area. There was a lot of street crime. Uh, we had a lot of drinking. We had a lot of assaults. Uh, we had panhandling. Uh, it became a special problem in a, a part of the city that needed to be addressed. Uh, the merchants were, many stores were going out of business. People would not frequent the areas. So we uh, have sent a special enforcement team in to work on that type of crime, the nuisance types of crime, of panhandling, drinking, uh, fighting, uh, generally disturbing the peace. Do the people that, that are picked up for violating these nuisance ordinances or these public order ordinances, do they uh, often commit real crimes in addition, or is this the extent of their misconduct? Oh, in that area, of course, uh, the crimes that are committed by these people, some are assaults, which some are felonies or assaults with a deadly weapon. Others have been narcotic sales. We have made many arrests for narcotics in that area by the street people. We have uh, a lot of LSD uh, we are finding uh, amongst that uh, transient group. What is done with people that your officers arrest for violating, say, the public drunkenness statute? What does the judge do? Usually they are booked at the county jail and they are to turned loose after six hours. Uh, people who are issued a citation for drinking in public, uh, many of them have had as many as six or seven citations issued against them. That would depend upon the judge uh, himself, where the judge uh, presiding at the time, and how he feels about enforcement of that type of crime. Usually, the people who are involved do not have any money. They are sometimes given time to pay, and sometimes they are, the, the cases are uh, dismissed. Do you think the repeal of the law banning sleeping in public places was a good idea or a bad idea? I think that uh, the retention of the anti-camping ordinance uh, was a good idea. The sleeping uh, ordinance was really not one that we were enforcing. Uh, we were mostly enforcing the camping ordinance, which uh, meant that a person had to have a sleeping bag or a tent or some other type of uh, uh, bedding, and that allowed us to then issue the citation. Uh, but the sleeping ordinance itself was rarely cited. Suppose a person is uh, on the streets and is acting in an eccentric manner, but has not violated any specific statute, <clears throat> and you think the person might be disturbed, or is a danger to himself, perhaps is mentally ill. What authority do your officers have to approach such a person? Usually we uh, are quite often approached uh, by a call. Someone will see, a citizen will see somebody acting in a rather bizarre behavior. An officer would be dispatched, but since 1964, when the Pettus Norman Bill was passed, uh, which had to do with uh, uh, mental illness in the state of California, uh, the police powers to do anything really are very, very restrictive. The only thing we can do is is arrive on the scene. We wait for a psychiatric evaluation team to come. The only way that this person may be incarcerated is if it's determined that he is a danger to himself or others. Uh, that is uh, rarely. Uh, discernible, and usually the officers and the PEP team pack up and leave. Let me turn to Inspector Durkin. Uh, you work in Philadelphia, a much larger city, which presumably has a much larger population of street people. How do your laws uh, resemble or differ from those you've heard described by Chief Lowry in Santa Barbara? It Some of them uh, are similar. Uh, we can take people into custody for public drunkenness. Uh, our policy is that uh, we will release that person to a family member or when the person is, becomes sober enough to uh, take care of themselves, they will be released. Is it illegal to drink in public in Philadelphia? Uh, there is a city ordinance about public drinking. Can you get in trouble for violating that city ordinance? Uh, it would be a summary citation. I see. What about panhandling? Is that legal or illegal? Panhandling is also illegal. What about sleeping in public on a park no. or on a bus bench? No, I don't believe so, sir. That's not illegal, no. so you can do that. Uh, how large a population of street people would you estimate you find in the downtown area of Philadelphia on a typical evening? Our estimates uh, vary between two and 300. How do you handle this population? Do you have any special units whose job it is to work this group? We have a special team only during the, the winter months. We, we have an, what we call an emergency winter outreach program. How does that work? Uh, when uh, a combination of factors are combined to produce either a, uh, a, a weather emergency involving a 10 degree above zero 
or uh, the uh, temperature and wind chill is combined to be 10 degrees above zero, we then uh, begin our emergency program. What does the emergency program consist of? Is it a police program or a it's mental health program? It is uh, interdepartmental. We have people who are trained mental health workers. We have social workers from our adult services department. Uh, we also have two police officers. The mental health worker and the adult services worker uh, patrol the center city area in an unmarked van uh, along with the police officers who are uniformed police officers in a marked van. And uh, we encourage people to seek shelter from the weather. What if they refuse to seek shelter? What do you do then? The, one of the purposes of the interdepartmental teams being formed was to diagnose the ability of our street people to recognize their level of risk. And what we're concerned with is that they are rational enough to realize that the weather could be a serious problem for their health, that it could possibly even kill them, that the weather is so bad on a particular night and if you're convinced they're not aware of these risks, what then are you empowered to do? We can proceed several different ways. Under the Mental Health Act, Mental Health Act in Pennsylvania, we can seek an involuntary commitment. Uh, Section 302 of the Mental Health Act will allow us to seek an uh, involuntary commi uh, commitment for up to five days. I see. Do the people of Philadelphia feel that you are being sufficiently aggressive or insufficiently aggressive in handling the street population? Do you think most citizens would like to see more people off the streets or do they not care? Well, we had a member of uh, the Chamber of Commerce suggest that uh, we address the problem by a specific city ordinance. A vagrancy ordinance? A type of vagrancy mm -hmm. ordinance, that's correct. What kind of response did he get? He got very little public support. The, uh, the media reaction was uh, very much against his particular position. Thank you. Bob Hayes, you are the legal counsel for the Coalition for the Homeless in New York City, but you're also familiar with this problem in many other cities. What rights do street people of the sort we're talking about now have or ought to have? <coughs> Fundamentally, like other citizens of a the country, they have the same rights everyone else does. So they don't have a right to misbehave. Uh, in growing number of jurisdictions around the country, they have some very important fundamental rights, like the right to have a place inside to get out of the cold. When folks, particularly police officers, as on your film, suggest that homeless people choose to live outside, that is almost always wrong. There are rare exceptions of severely mentally ill people who may not know enough to come inside, but neither alcoholism nor mental illness are disabilities that result in people enjoying things like malnutrition, hypothermia, frostbite. So you're saying that the city has an obligation to provide shelter for people who are in this homeless category? There are now a number of jurisdictions. I say New York City, Philadelphia, Atlantic City, the state of West Virginia, parts of California, where courts have recognized that society does have an obligation to provide some emergency shelter to homeless people. It's a growing development in the area of law. It's a sad development because primarily we are fighting for things like the right to shelter simply because there's not enough housing for these folks. Do you think it should be illegal to drink in public or to be drunk in public? Um, possibly. I think with regard to street people, the constitutional argument will always be, and the sensible argument will always be, you've got to apply law fairly. So if public drunkenness is illegal and police officers have an obligation to clean up the streets in a particular section of town, it should be done. On the other hand, if half of Yale Bowl is filled with drunks during a football game against Harvard, I suppose the same law should apply. I see. Do you think it should be illegal to sleep in a public place, such as on a park bench or on a bus stop? I wish to God in this country in the mid-1980s it could be made illegal. The reason people are out there is not because they're rejecting offers inside. You can go to Santa Barbara, you can hear the police sergeant say, these people are choosing to live on the streets, but I would define that same sergeant to find a place inside that was safe, that was decent, that that homeless person who was on the park bench could go to. 
you know, we shouldn't have to be discussing in a relatively affluent society whether people should have a right to sleep outside. They shouldn't have to be, they wouldn't be choosing it, except in the rare exceptions of people who are very mentally ill or people who want to camp out, because a lot of campers like to do that. But For that's that recreation, that's not homelessness. I see. Suppose it could be established, and I'm not sure whether this is right or not, that a person <coughs> uh, having had all the opportunities to have shelter provided, nonetheless said he prefers to sleep in the public park in the downtown area. Do you think the police should uh, try to preserve the quality of that park by taking the person off of it? Or do you think that after all is said and done, if he wants to camp there, he should be allowed to camp there? You're, you're asking basically an academic question. Sure. We have a country where maybe two or three million Americans have been squeezed out of a housing market. And maybe there's a handful of free spirits who want to live outside. But that is not really the issue that has to be addressed. And it certainly is not the police issue because by and large, the poor victims of this housing crunch and this lack of shelter for American people is not just homeless people living outside, but police officers in cities across the country who have absolutely no idea what to do with these folks. Well, let's talk about that. If, suppose you were advising police departments. What advice would you give them as to how to organize <coughs> and train themselves to deal with this problem? Number one, to understand that the police force, as much as other um, members of a particular city, have got to fight so that other responsible arms of government other than the police force deal with these people. That means housing agencies, social welfare agencies, and in some cases mental health agencies. Um, I mean by and large people, even mentally ill people, are not outside because of an abundance of civil liberties. In many cases there simply is no room inside a hospital. So again in city after city after city you see police officers knowing someone is in danger, knowing a person is severely mentally ill, but also knowing if he takes the person in, he'll wait for the rest of his shift at the hospital, and then there won't be any room inside, and the person will be discharged. So the first responsibility is to provide alternatives and to inform police officers as to what those alternatives are. I think that's fair. Let me turn to Chief Lowry. You've heard uh, Bob Hayes say that he is convinced that only a tiny fraction of free spirits choose to sleep in public places. Would you agree or disagree with that? Well, I think that probably depends upon the city and the area. Uh, we have a certain element of street people, and we have a certain element of homeless people. We have a certain element, probably 20 percent, that is mentally ill. The mentally ill are extremely difficult to deal with because of the, of the uh, legislated law, which doesn't uh, allow us to do anything but refer them to their caseworker. Uh, these people are on the street uh, with no one to, uh, to help them to see that they get their medicine. They receive some funds each month, uh, which they do not know how to control. And usually it's gone in two or three days, probably sometimes as a victim of other, other street people. Uh, we have, uh, I think, a hardcore group that has chosen a lifestyle, likes to be on the street. Uh, the rest that we make uh, in this one area, I think the latest figures of 108 people that we arrested, 62% of those people have had prior felony arrests. Uh, we find a lot of narcotics. We find uh, LSD. I think that's a different type of person. The housing that he spoke of is absolutely true. Uh, the city of Santa Barbara is, uh, uh, property is expensive. We have a water moratorium. There are all kinds of things that, that impact on that. 52% uh, of my police officers can't afford to live in the city of Santa Barbara. They live in Oxnard and Ventura and, and uh, Do your uh, police Rompuk. officers feel that the city has an obligation to provide them with shelter? I think they feel much as, uh, as the citizen does. Uh, that, uh, that the city does not have the uh, responsibility of providing shelter to everybody. Uh, I think most of the citizens have uh, stated that. Where, do, where does the city of Santa Barbara's responsibility end, and how much is our fair share? Let me ask Inspector Durkin, you've heard Bob Hayes' comments. How would you describe the proportion of people that your group comes in contact with who would prefer to live on the streets or who would really prefer to have shelter were it available? I think you have to differentiate between various groups. We have a, a number of people who are former mental patients. At one time or another, they were institutionalized. We have a group consisting mainly of alcoholics. Uh, there are some other substance abusers in the group. Do uh, you think the alcoholic, just focusing on them for a moment, need shelter, that the city is supplying shelter and they're not using, or do you think that there's a, there's a shelter shortage in Philadelphia? Well, I, I think that uh, as quickly as pr we provide shelter bids, they're filled. The, last year, during our winter outreach, when we began, 
uh, we very, in a very short amount of time, all the people who voluntarily wanted to come in and get shelter were off the streets. Uh, we had to deal the remainder of the winter with the group of people who had a problem with mental illness, with the group of alcoholics, with the substance abusers, who uh, constantly refused to go to shelter. Uh, I believe not so much that they chose to remain on the street as uh, the types of shelter, for instance, provided to an alcoholic would be a, uh, a treatment center. Mm -hmm. And quite frankly, some of these people do not want treatment. Let me ask Bob Hayes on this score. Do you think the city has an obligation to supply something more than shelter? Should this shelter also supply treatment for people who are alcohol abusers or mentally ill or the like? <coughs> Whether it's cast as an obligation, Mr. Wilson, or as common sense, my answer would be yes. Of course it makes a lot more sense to give someone a place to get out of the cold to survive the night. But you don't want to maintain dependence in people. So of course, whether it's mental health care, or in the case of growing numbers of homeless children, literacy training, education, or whether it's some kind of detoxification program, yeah, it's desperately needed. And again, sure, some people won't go into it, but more often than not, in almost every city in, in this country, there's a very, very, very long waiting list to get into those programs, and people on the streets are very often the names on those lists. Should the police be involved in this at all, or do you think some other kind of city agency should manage these outreach programs that contact people in the community? Look, the police have to be involved in controlling the peace and dealing with criminal conduct, and whether a street person, homeless person is committing it, or a Wall Street lawyer is committing it, I think the answer is yes, there's a room for police involvement. Thank you, gentlemen, and thank you, ladies and gentlemen, for watching. For Crime File, I'm James Wilson. Funding for this program was provided by the National Institute of Justice. This program was produced by the Police Foundation, which is solely responsible for its content.